before we can get to the point where we can quantify a system at chemical reaction equilibrium, we first need to define a way in which we can describe the extent of that chemical reaction. Conversion is often used to express the extent of the reaction. However, conversion is a component-specific quantity, and it depends on how much of that specific component you had in your system at the beginning of the reaction. You will therefore get a different answer whether you consider, consider the conversion of A, B, or C. Rule of thumb is to specify the conversion of the limiting reagent in the system. We are going to express the extent of the reaction in terms of a variable that is referred to as the reaction coordinate for which we use the symbol epsilon. And this is a quantity that is exactly the same for each of the components in the reacting system. First, some definitions. The stoichi stoichiometric number of each of the components, very important. It is negative. For those expressed as reactants, we are going to read our reaction systems from left to right. It doesn't mean that it cannot actually take place from right to left because we are going to be considering equilibrium reactions. However, the protocol is we read from left to right, stoichiometric numbers, negative for reactants as written and positive for um, products. The stoichiometric number is then the change in the number of moles in that, of that component in that reaction divided by its stoichiometric number. So let's consider an example. If one mole of A reacts, delta N of A is minus 1 divided by minus 1, and the extent of the reaction will then be equal to 1. This must now be the same for component B. So if one mole of A reacts, it means that two moles of B will be used. So delta N is minus 2 divided by its stoichiometric number, minus 2. 3 moles will form of C delta N is 3 divided by its stoichiometric number, 3. And again, the reaction coordinate will be equal to 1. In differential form, we can express it as DE or D epsilon equal to DN of each of the components divided by its stoichiometric number. Now we want to use this reaction coordinate to express our composition in our reacting mixture. If we have to write mole fractions, instead of having when you have three components, three unknown mole fractions, we want to express our mole fractions in terms of this reaction coordinate. So we have one unknown in the system instead of the three individual mole fractions. In order to do that, we set up a stoichiometric table. So write all your components there in the first row, and now proceed to define the number of moles present initially before any reaction started to take place. So number of moles at time zero. Sum of all the number of moles at time zero will give us the total number of moles present initially. Define all your stoichiometric numbers and using our definition of our reaction coordinate, we can now write the number of moles at any point in our reaction for each of the components in terms of the amount initially present, its stoichiometric number and one variable which is the reaction coordinate. Now we can calculate the number of moles at any point in our reaction by adding up the number of moles of each of the components to get to our total number of moles. In this case, because of the sum of all the stoichiometric numbers is equal to zero, there will be no net expansion or contraction in terms of the number of moles present in that system. Subsequently, we can proceed to calculate the mole fraction of each of the components by simply dividing its number of moles expressed as a function of the reaction coordinate divided by the tumber, total number of moles, which if the sum of the stoichiometric numbers is not equal to zero, will also be a function of the reaction coordinate. In example 13.1 in Smith Van Essen Abbott, the reactants are not fed to the reactor in stoichiometric amounts. So 
if we now want to set up our stoichiometric table, consider all the components, the number of moles initially present in the reactor as stated by the example, 2 moles of methane, 1 mole water, 1 mole carbon monoxide and 4 moles of hydrogen, which gives us a total amount of 8 moles at the initial state of the system. Now we can complete the row that gives the stoichiometric numbers of each of the components. Please note that even though we write this as reactants going to products and that's the way we will report the stoichiometric numbers, since we have some of the components written as products in the system present initially, the reaction might as well just take place in the opposite direction. But in this case, we write as we read from left to right, negative 1, negative 1, positive 1, positive 3 for our stoichiometric numbers. If we add them, we get a positive 2. So this means that we will form net 2 moles per mole reaction, if the reaction proceeds in the, written, in the direction as written. Using our definition of the reaction coordinate, we can now calculate the number of moles of each of the components as a function of its initial amount in the mixture and its stoichiometric number and the reaction coordinate. So we can proceed to do that. Again, we can now calculate the total number of moles at any point in our reaction system, which is either equal to the sum of all the individual number of moles or total number initial, initially plus stoichiometric number total times the reaction coordinate. Each mole fraction can then be calculated by considering the number of moles of that component divided by the total number of moles in the system. So we can repeat that for each of our components meaning that we can express the 4 mole fractions in terms of only one unknown, which is our reaction coordinate. Of course, it is possible to express the conversion of each of the components, x, in terms of our reaction coordinate. It is the number of moles initially of that component minus the number of moles present at any time divided by the initial amount. Here it is given for methane. If we want to calculate the conversion for water expressed in terms of the reaction coordinate, it's the initial number of moles minus the number of moles at any point divided by the initial number of moles. So for water, it is simply equal to the reaction coordinate. In example 13.3, a more complicated system is concerned, and of course this is the direction that we want to aim for, is what happens if we've got multiple reactions in the system. Each of the reactions can be defined by its own reaction coordinate. So our stoichiometric table now contains two rows with stoichiometric numbers, and the number of moles of each of the components can be expressed as a function of each of the two reaction coordinates. So let's just consider for methane, if two moles were initially fed to the reactor, stoichiometric number for reaction 1, minus 1, minus 1 for reaction 2, and the number of moles at the end can be expressed in terms of the two reaction coordinates. Total number of moles at the end by either just considering 5 plus 2 epsilon 1 plus 2 2 epsilon 2, or if I add the number of moles of each of the individual components, I should end up with exactly the same expression. And once again, this can now be used, I know it's really small, but look in your textbooks if you can't read this, to express the mole fractions of each of the components in terms of these two reaction coordinates. So we proved in a previous series of lecture slides that the change in Gibbs free energy for a system at constant temperature and pressure must always be negative. What we must remember is that at equilibrium the condition of constant temperature and pressure is met because all the macroscopic variables of our system actually remains constant. 
When chemical reaction equilibrium is reached, of course, it means that there will be no more change in the Gibbs free energy. So if I feed a system containing this composition and I express the Gibbs free energy of the system in terms of the reaction coordinate, it means that the reaction will take place until this turning point in the Gibbs free energy is met. It cannot thermodynamically, it is not allowed to pass that point because then the change in Gibbs free energy will be positive and this condition will be violated. If the mixture is at this position initially, I can express the Gibbs free energy as a function of the reaction coordinate. As soon as it achieves this state, the reaction will stop because advancing past this position will imply an increase in the Gibbs free energy again and our condition will be violated. This now allows us to come up with an equation, a mathematical expression that we can use to define equilibrium as a function of our reaction coordinate because we know that at this point the slope if we can express the Gibbs free energy as a function of epsilon the slope of that equation must go to zero or it is where the change in Gibbs free energy is equal to zero. Just some additional comments on the concepts that we discussed in this lecture. The stoichiometric number, you should remember, is not dimensionless. It has units of mole of that component, changing the moles of that component per mole reaction. So for A, it's one minus one mole of A per mole of reaction. So if we want to discover the units of our reaction coordinate, it is the moles of I divided by the units of our stoichiometric number, mole of each component per mole reaction. So therefore the units of our epsilon is in mole reaction. So let's just change this example a little bit. Still consider the reaction A plus B reversible goes to C. And this is specified as the initial number of moles of each of the components, 3, 1, and 5, meaning that we've got a total of 9 stoichiometric numbers as specified. And we can write our number of moles at any point in the reaction as a function of epsilon. Subsequently, still, because that is 0, the total number of moles will not change. And I can express my mole fractions in terms of the reaction coordinate. Consider the following questions. Can the value of epsilon be less than zero, in other words, negative? And what does that mean? Do the number of moles specified initially for each of the components and the stoichiometric number of each of the components subsequently place a restriction on feasible values for epsilon and for the system as described here? Can you figure out what the range of feasible values for epsilon might be. And finally, will the equation sum of the mole fractions must be equal to 1 give me an independent equation that I can use to solve epsilon?